So we just have a little bit left on um, chapter 10. Uh, we were talking about minerals, which is group number, food group number five. Um, so calcium, remember, is the most abundant mineral in the body because we've not only got it stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum for muscle contraction, but obviously the bones store a lot of calcium as well. Um, and we've got to have that calcium in the muscle tissue so that muscles can contract. Um, heart muscle also uses calcium, so for our heart to keep beating, we need calcium in the muscle tissue. Um, when we're younger, we need calcium for, um, for tooth development. Um, so about 99% of the calcium in the body is stored in the bones. But as we talked about with osteoporosis, if necessary, if we don't provide enough calcium for all the, all the other jobs, it will leach calcium from the bones if necessary. Okay? So that can increase fracture risk. Um, it's particularly a problem for small white females um, and increases risk for fractures in the spine, the wrists, and the head, typically. Um, what else? I think that was mostly what we wanted for calcium. And then iron, remember we need iron for aerobic work because iron sits within the hemoglobin in the red blood cells. And without that iron, the hemoglobin can't pick up oxygen and deliver it to the muscle tissue. Okay. So um, it's the most common mineral deficiency. Um, so if we have uh, iron deficient anemia, so we've not got enough iron in our red blood cells, then that's going to impact aerobic performance quite dramatically. All right. Um, doesn't have too much effect on an anaerobic performance, um, but huge effects on aerobic. All right. um, it's a problem for vegetarians because often they don't get enough iron in their diet. They have to be really careful. Um, and the other one, the sports anemia, um, I think we talked about uh, in the when we were looking at the vascular system. Sports anemia occurs when we start training after a bit of a break. So let's say we took some time off over the summer, we come back to training, and the initial response to endurance training is an increase in blood plasma volume. And it takes the, the, um, the red blood cells kind of come later if we're training at altitude. And it takes a while for that blood plasma volume to kind of realign itself. So there's a, there's a period of time when you first start training where you've got more plasma volume with the same amount of red blood cell count. And so it looks like anemia in a blood test, even though it isn't actually anemia. Okay, so that's, that's the sport anemia. So, if we have sports anemia, we don't need to take an iron supplement. If we have true iron deficient anemia, then we really need to be taking a supplement, particularly if we are an aerobic athlete. Okay. And then, the last little bit I'm going to do is the competition meals and I'll summarize the information here. Um, so before the competition, the goal of a meal is to ensure that you've got steady blood glucose levels um, to enhance performance. Okay. But we have to be careful about the timing of the one before the competition. The typical um, recommendation is that you would eat three hours before 
a training session or a competition. Um, if we eat too close to the training or the event, so half an hour or so, then that can cause a very quick drop in blood glucose due to that insulin response to the carbohydrate in the meal that you ate at that point. So within 15, 20 minutes or so of your endurance event, your legs are gonna go wobbly and you're gonna get lightheaded. So that's a big problem. Thing is, it's an individual response. Not everybody indicates that bigger spike in insulin after eating carbohydrate close to the event, right? So it's a really individual thing. You've got to work that out for yourself. Are you one of those people who can eat a banana and a, a banana sandwich or something 45 minutes before your event or half an hour before your event? Or are you someone that can't eat earlier than two hours or three hours before the event? Right? And even three hours before the event, particularly if it's an endurance, um, has been shown to be quite, um, quite important because if you read the information in the chapter here, they talk about cyclists and they were testing cyclists at about 70 or 80 percent intensity, I think it said. Um, and the cyclists who met three hours before the test managed a significantly longer amount of time on the bike before they reached exhaustion than the cyclists who weren't given anything to eat, who went in hungry. Right? So that's, you know, that's something to pay attention to if we want optimal performance. Whoa. Okay. So before the competition, we are looking for something that isn't going to leave you hungry or with undigested food in your stomach. So again, you've got to practice it, right? Because remember that when we start exercising or being physically active, that blood flow to the stomach gets redirected to the working muscles. So that food can stay undigested if you don't time it right or you eat the wrong thing, right? Uh, it wants to be low in fat and fiber, um, which will increase gastric emptying and hopefully minimize gastrointestinal distress. You don't want too much fiber and then be getting very gassy, windy or cramping because of gas, right? So you want to be careful about that. Somewhere around two to three hundred grams of carbohydrate. Don't really want fat, so about two to five hundred calories. Um, not too much fat because that sits in the stomach, takes too long to digest. So three or three or so hours ahead of time. Or this might be, if you need to eat closer to the event, this might be a good time to use some kind of shake, a fruit and vegetable shake or something like that. Something that's very easy to digest so it's not sitting there. Um, if it's within an hour, definitely should be liquid so that you maximize gastric emptying before you start. And super important, try it out ahead of time. Don't eat anything, especially if it's an important competition, don't eat anything you haven't ever tried before. You know, you, you say, oh, I'm a bit peckish, and someone says, oh, I've got this granola bar, but you've never had that granola bar before. Don't eat that, because you have no idea what effect that's going to have on your stomach if you haven't tried it, okay? So after the competition, we have... A different, um, a different goal with the eating, right? When we're eating after competition or after training, then the goal is to aid recovery um, by restoring glycogen and improving protein synthesis and things like that, right? So it's a different role 
the eating afterwards plays. Okay. Um, so if we need to replenish carb stores quickly, right? Because let's say you're doing um, repetitive bouts, uh, so you're a runner, right? And you've got multiple rounds to run on that day, right? Then um, one of the first two points is something that you want to be thinking about, right? If you've got to replenish carb stores very quickly, then the suggestion is just under half a gram of carbs per kilogram of body mass every 15 minutes for four hours, if you can manage that, right? You've got to be careful with that strategy because that's likely to increase your calorie intake above what you would want, right? Especially if the rest is quite brief. Um, if less quickly, then you want to eat as soon as you can within your two hour window, and then at every two hours for up to six hours, right? So we've got, I've got some data to show you on the next slide. You want to get that, that food in within two hours to maximum glycogen, to maximize glycogen storage. Now, if you don't have to compete or try, and you could use this for two a days as well, right? Say you're gonna do uh, weights in the morning, and then you've got a bit of a break, and then you've got skills and strategies and gameplay in the afternoon, then you can use the same kind of idea. If, however, I'm only training once a day, or I only have to compete once every 24 hours or something, if I've got a good 24-hour window between events or training, then it's less important to worry about this immediacy because typically your glycogen stores would get fully replenished using your new normal diet, right? Your balanced diet. So it depends what your training program is like, it depends what um, sport event you do, okay? Um, and then number Three is not to add to that carbohydrate, add some protein. Okay, so you want to ingest the protein, although it's not necessary for glycogen synthesis, there is evidence that it may improve glycogen synthesis, right? It also means that your muscles have got those amino acids in the system to start repairing and it creates an anabolic environment. Okay. So this graph is not in our book, but here they're just looking at glycogen, not at protein um, synthesis. But this is our two hour window. Right? So if we have glycogen within our two hour window, we see much improved glycogen synthesis than if we don't. And here's our two to four hour window, at which point the, the change is a little less drastic, right? So this is the two hour window is the key to glycogen synthesis and getting those amino acids into the system as quick as you can. Right. So remember our percentages, okay? Carbohydrate would be 45 to 65% of our diet. For a normal person, 45 to 50. Okay. Our fats are gonna be equal to, but I would say less than 30%, and less than 10% of those want to be saturated. And our protein has quite a big range from 10 to 
35% is a lot of protein for most people, right? So for a, for a normal person, you would not encourage them to be eating that much protein. Um, unless I'm proved totally wrong and all the keto stuff turns out to be accurate. But we've got ways to go on that research yet. So, all right. Now, at this point in the new edition, they have a whole new section that I didn't know was there. So, I am not going to cover, unfortunately, microbiome and probiotics, all right? So you're not responsible for that section. Doesn't mean it's not interesting and that you might not want to read it and use it, but we're not going to have anything from that section on the exam, okay? Questions? Kayla, sorry my love, you got outvoted. That's okay, I can live with it. <laughs> if you want some specific information on, the, on that other chapter, let me know and I can um, provide you with some notes. So, we are going to cover chapter 11, fluid and electrolyte challenges. Um, now, my plan is to do as much of it as I can today and then finish off on Friday. But on Friday, hopefully, there won't be so much to finish that I can't also start chapter 12. 12, I think it is, the um, environmental information. Otherwise, we are not going to get done in time for your review next Friday. Okay, so let's see how we can get on here. Don't forget to check your learning objectives at the beginning of the chapter. Okay, so water is considered food group number six, although it doesn't have any calories it's more important than any of the other food groups from a survival point of view. Um, 9 to 12% loss of body mass through water loss it, it is pretty much fatal. So there's not a very big window there for dehydration and things before you're really, really in trouble. Okay. Um, it forms the plasma in, in blood right? um, and maintains blood volume. It serves as a solvent in that respect for proteins and fats and carbs. Okay. Um, it plays a role in maintaining body temperature by um, being a large part of the sweat that we release that evaporates and acts as a cooling mechanism and it also the blood is responsible for carrying heat from the core up to the skin so that the heat can um, be released through the skin so lots of roles that we can't manage without and we really can only survive a few days you can actually survive a week, couple of weeks without protein, carbs, and fats. You're not going to be very well, right? <laughs> if you go two weeks without those, but with luck, you wouldn't be dead. Okay? You don't have that long with water, so you have to be very careful about it. Um, about 60% of our total body weight is water. 75% of lean tissue weight. So our Predominantly our muscles, but bones also do contain a little bit of water in them. Um, but predominantly muscle 
has a lot. If you think about uh, getting some, uh, um, what do you call it? Hamburger mints, right? And you fry that up. Think about how much water you have to pour off before you make the hamburgers with it, right? So, and then fat tissue, adipose tissue has significantly less water in it, only about 25%, right? Women, um, obese people, because they have a larger percentage of fat mass, and the elderly, because they have less muscle mass, all have a smaller percentage of water that would count as their weight. Okay? So it's vital to mental performance, right? If, you, if you're dehydrated, I think it's around 1%, you already start to lose focus and concentration, okay? But from a physical standpoint, a 2% reduction in water mass is a, a big drop in endurance performance and, and some other sport performances as well, as you can see as we move on. All right, so 2% if you're an endurance athlete, again, is a very small window for you to see a drop in performance. to ingest is going to be very much dependent upon what kind of physical activity we're doing, what's the environmental temperature that we're working in, what's the humidity of the environment that we're working in. Um, as we'll see when we go to the next chapter, if it's hot and humid, we've got an even bigger problem than if it's just hot. Okay. So that means it's quite difficult to establish a daily amount of water that we should ingest, right? Um, any kind of liquids can count towards that total. Certain foods have more water in them than others, so they also contribute to the ingested total. Um, metabolic water. So when do we make metabolic water? Are we working anaerobically or aerobically? Say that one more time. When do we make metabolic water? Are we working anaerobically or aerobically? Aerobically. Aerobically, yeah, good. At the end of the electron transport chain, right? So, good. All right. So, um, we want as best as we can to try to balance the water we're ingesting with the water that we're excreting. Um, and that could be linked to your energy expenditure for the day. And if you have a look at um, page 335, they've got some calculations here to help you um, balance related to the activity that you're doing. Okay. Um, on average, we lose about two and a half liters of water a day. Big man is going to lose more, a little girl is going to lose less, right? Um, and so, as I said, we've got to try to get this balanced state. So when we're balanced, normal hydration is called new hydration. Hypohydration is um, too little water, which means I have an overall net loss. And that's going to lead to dehydration if we don't correct it quite quickly.
So, typically, right? So we're gonna lose water through urine, through sweat, less or more, depending on how much exercise, what the environment is like, etc. Some in our feces, and then some in what we call insensible perspiration. So that's predominantly um, like breathing out the water vapor that's in your breath when you breathe out. Okay. So what we have to do is balance this loss. Okay. So that's going to be liquids, foods, depending upon the food groups that we choose. If we eat plenty of fruits and vegetables, then we're going to meet our food ingestion, right? And our metabolic water when we're working aerobically. Right? So we're looking for these two columns to balance out here. Right? So 1,400 milliliters, so that's at rest. That's about one and a half liters a day just to sit still all day, right? So the two and a half liters includes getting up, walking around, going to class, right? So we need a lot of water all the time. If our intake, so if this column is higher than the loss column, then urine output is going to increase. So we'll talk in a minute about the body's mechanisms for keeping water relatively even in the body. All right. So we'll see urine output um, go up if necessary. All right. Sweat loss is an important clue here. And again, we'll come back to talking about sweat loss in a moment. If our intake, if so if this number over here is less than our loss, then we're starting to be dehydrated and there are health concerns, decreased performance, um, and it can lead to death. So this balance is pretty important here. Okay. I am looking for that. Okay. So one of the ways that we can estimate our sweat loss, our water loss, is by using a scale. And it's the only time <laughs> I'm going to suggest that you use a scale on, on a relatively regular basis. All right. So the idea is, and if you look at page 336, they talk to you about this as well. The idea is that you will weigh yourself in a eu-hydrated state. All right. So. First thing in the morning, possibly, or before your training session when you know you're fully hydrated because you've been paying attention to it, right? No clothes, stand on the scale, see what you weigh. Get dressed for training, go train, come back, clothes off, stand on the scale, and any weight loss between pre training and post training has to be water. Right? There's nothing else you can lose in one training session. So it's not fat, it's not protein, it's not bone. Right? So it has to be water loss. And so that gives you an indication of how well you maintained hydration during training. Did you drink enough while you were training? Right? And if not, and you've lost enough weight, 
then you need to look at how do I make up that water loss over the next few hours. Um, the chapter also looks at factors that help to maintain you hydration and electrolytes are one of those factors. So an electrolyte is a mineral salt that when you dissolve it in water it separates and we have positive and negative ions. Okay. The ion is the charged molecule, so remember back to when we were looking at um, the neural impulse, the action potential, and we were looking at the fact that we had sodium and potassium gates and sodium and potassium moving across the membrane, right? Ions. If they're positive, like sodium, they're cations. If they're negative, like uh, chloride, they're anions, right? So when we look at the body, water would not be distributed equally around the body without the use of electrolytes, right? We use electrolytes to make sure the water is where we want it in the body. Water doesn't carry an electrical charge very well, so it's, it's not any good to help the muscle and the nerve carry the uh, impulse. Right? We have to have these ions available. So the electrolytes allow the electrical charge, the action potential to occur, and that would, that's obviously essential when we're looking at skeletal muscle, at cardiac muscle, and at, nervous, at neurons and um, the nervous system. Right? The membranes are often select, selectively permeable in these excitable um, tissues. So remember we open a sodium gate and sodium can cross. We have to open a potassium gate for potassium to cross. Right? Other ions can't get across those membranes. And the other thing that electrolytes do is that they, co they create osmotic pressure which holds water and then it can move around the body in and out of tissues as is needed by moving the electrolytes. So we'll have a look at that. So. The saying is that water follows solute, okay? It's a little bit like a back to front, um, high to low, right? That we used earlier in the semester for um, gases and for, for like the oxygen and the carbon dioxide transport, right? So here in picture A, We've got two, and you could imagine this is a cell, and this is a cell, and here's a membrane that is permeable, but selectively permeable, right? In picture B, we've added electrolytes to one cell, right, one site. So that means that technically we've got um, less water per molecule of solute inside um, on the left than we do on the right. right. And so what happens is the water will move through the membrane until the concentration of the electrolytes is the same on both sides of the membrane. So it can move, the water can move in either direction, right? But the tendency is to move in order to balance the electrolytes across the membrane, right? That allows the cells 
to control the movement of the water by controlling the amount of electrolyte in the cell. Right, so, that, so the cell can indirectly control the movement of the water. Does that make a little bit of sense? So we want the concentrations of electrolytes to be as constant as possible. And how that is controlled is predominantly by the kidneys and by the gastrointestinal tract. Right? So the kidneys, if sodium is um, measured as low, then the kidneys will conserve sodium. And they do that by reabsorbing the sodium instead of excreting it. So your sodium level in your urine would go down if your sodium levels in your body were low. Right? They do that, the mechanism that that occurs by, right? So the kidneys have um, adrenal glands uh, associated with them, and the adrenal glands. Um, get stimulated when there's low sodium, and they release aldosterone, which is a hormone, and the aldosterone stimulates the kidneys to reabsorb the sodium. Right? The gastrointestinal tract, or the GI tract, absorbs minerals at the level of the small intestine. And so if there's a particular mineral that is low for some reason, right, you, you're not eating it in your diet or there's something going on and for some reason that is not getting absorbed, then the GI tract will absorb more of that mineral than normal, assuming that you're giving it to your body in your, in your diet, right? So when we exercise, we don't just lose water in our sweat, right? We lose electrolytes as well, in particular sodium, because you can taste it, right? If you're sweating a lot, it tastes salty, right, when you're sweating. So when we're exercising then, that dramatically increases the workload for the kidneys and the small intestine, right? So, we can see that they're very effective at maintaining this balance because if we were unable to maintain equilibrium or the, the constant concentrations, then we would see dysfunction in muscle contraction, dysfunction in um, uh, nerve impulse transmission, um, this could lead to injury and eventually it would lead to death. Right? So they're very, very good at doing their job. In most circumstances, the kidneys and the GI tract can maintain electrolyte equilibrium very well without any help. But under certain circumstances, when we exercise in certain situations, we have to help them out a little bit. Okay, so sweat is what we call hypotonic. Hypotonic means that it has less electrolytes in it than the blood does and therefore the osmotic pressure is lower than it is in the blood, right? When we exercise and it's very, very hot, 
or we're doing something really, really intense, instead of our one and a half to two and a half liters, we can lose up to three to four liters per hour if we're working out in the heat and the humidity. Right? So just think about a liter bottle of water and imagine that you're going to lose three times that amount if you're a biggish person. Right? Three times that amount if you're exercising in the heat. Right? So it's really important, again, and it leads into what we'll do in the next chapter. It's really important that we can get acclimatized to the heat because that helps with this electrolyte balance. Right? We sweat at a higher rate, so we sweat more water we start sweating sooner, but we reduce the electrolyte content in the sweat. So, um, and we increase plasma volume. So what happens is that as we acclimatize, the sweat is gonna taste less salty, okay? So there's more sweat, but it's less salty. Okay, if we can manage to acclimatize. If we're sweating a lot, then we may need to help out the kidneys and the GI tract. Typically in a Western diet, there's plenty of salt in our food. Um, especially if we're buying packaged foods, or you know, I don't know how you guys cook your rice or your vegetables, but I always add salt to the water when I'm boiling rice or I'm boiling potatoes um, because the rice and the potatoes taste better when you do it that way, right? Um, so, you know, we add, there's salt in the food often and then sometimes we add salt as well, right? So, typically, as I said, the kidneys and the GI tract can manage on their own. If we're training in the heat, particularly if we're doing training for a long endurance event like a marathon, we may need some extra electrolytes, right? So we might need to use a sport drink, an electrolyte drink, under those circumstances, or you might have seen um, the little like jelly cubes, so uh, long distance swimmers don't use a drink, they use little jelly cubes, but I've also seen those in, when I've watched the marathon on telly, some people will use a jelly cube rather than a drink, okay? Um, they're not jelly, but you know, they're like a little cube that has electrolytes in them. So we said that we lose water through sweat, we also lose water through our urine and the urine also contains electrolytes. So the content of the urine is going to differ depending upon what the kidneys are doing, right? Are they pulling back sodium or are they flushing sodium out? So during exercise, the harder the exercise becomes, the lower the sodium levels in the urine. So when we're working out really, really hard, our sodium content in the urine is only about 10 to 20% of what our sodium content is when we're at rest. Okay. So, there's two mechanisms that that occurs by. One is that we excrete less sodium per liter of urine water, and the urine output changes in response to exercise. And you may not even have monitored that, right? So you'll have to pay attention to it. If you go from rest to light, work, 
then urine output increases. But during moderate intensity to high intensity physical activity, urine input output decreases. So the harder you work, the less likely it is that you're going to feel like you've got to go for a pee. Right? So you have to pay attention during training and, and, and see if you can pick that up. Right? Okay, we'll start first. We might not get it finished. Okay, so the idea of being thirsty is that conscious thought, oh, I'm thirsty, like my mouth feels dry, I need a drink, right? I've got a dry mouth. And that is your brain's way of telling you you need water. So it's a very important mechanism in the idea of maintaining your hydration status. Okay? If I want to stay hydrated, I need to pay attention to that thirst mechanism. Okay? So it's controlled by an area in the brain within the hypothalamus that is able to recognize the osmolality of the blood plasma. And so when the, um, there's also uh, um, sensory cells in the spine, so I, I'm also picking up the, the level of water in the cerebrospinal fluid, um, how much sodium is in the brain, right? So these, this area of the brain within the hypothalamus is getting all this information. So that means that in order to feel thirsty, I have to have already become somewhat dehydrated for the hypothalamus to pick that up. So it's a problem, right? Because if I rely just on my thirst mechanism, then by the time I'm thirsty, I'm already a little bit dehydrated. Okay. Then if I'm losing body water because I'm sweating, then that's going to stimulate the thirst mechanism even more. Okay. So, that means that at some point we have to ingest enough fluid to return the concentration to normal and turn off that feeling of being thirsty. Okay. So we'll stop there and we'll talk a little bit more about thirsty on Friday. Questions? No questions? No, did I just shut? <laughs> I didn't mean to shut the classroom. Uh-oh. Oh well. No one had any questions anyway. I guess it doesn't matter. Oops.